Um, the, the first thing that I would like to do as um, part of my culture, uh, it's something we, 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 we do, um, and that's to acknowledge all elders and uh, all um, traditional owners of this country. I'd also acknowledge all um, other Indigenous clans who are represented here today. And I'd also like to welcome our non-Indigenous friends and to acknowledge the hard work and support which you offer either as service providers or as researchers within the area of Indigenous gambling. Um, also, please excuse me, I, I do sort of like to move around a, a lot. Um, however, I'm going to have to sort of duck behind here a bit um, just to sort of um, uh, tap the, um, the slide presentation for you. So forgive me for sort of um, standing behind the, the screen. Okay, um, allow me to begin this presentation by using the words and concepts of my beautiful ancient culture. I therefore say to you, Narinjiri Mimini, Kungan Nakan Yanan. I have told you who I am and what, what I do. Translated, I have explained that I'm a Narinjiri woman from South Australia, Australia, and I'm here to Kungan or to listen but not superficially. The concept of kungan in our language is a different type of listening. That is, it's a very intense activity that you participate in when you kungan and kungan properly. So it's not like um, um, you know, look, looking at, at someone, um, but really you're listening to the, the morning tea being sort of wheeled in out in the foyer and, and thinking, oh, gee, I hope some of the, they bring some more of those blueberry muffins. But kungan is to, um, like I said, you engage in a very intense activity. I've also informed you that I'm here to nakan, to use my peelies, that is my eyes, to look or to see. And I'm here to yanan or to speak. Now, in traditional societies, those three skills, listening or looking, watching and speaking, and not necessarily through the spoken word, but through nonverbal communication. Those three acquisitions could have been the difference between your survival and safety, or the, the safety and well-being of others. Kungan nakan yanan could also have been the difference in what you ate on any given day, or if you ate at all. And I suspect that those three skills are essential in all traditional societies throughout the world. And they are also important skills for any researcher in contemporary society, regardless of your background or the background of your participants. Kungan nakan yanan are extremely important skills to develop. And the challenge is, did we kungan properly? Did we nakan our data and impose our own biases? Or did we attempt to look at our material through an indigenous lens? And finally, did we yanan in a way that our participants clearly understood exactly what it was that we were speaking about? Or did we engage unknowingly in an unbalanced power relationship? So as I proceed to Yanan, I hope you kungan, and also I hope that there might be something of use that you can share with others. However, before I start talking about my views related to why and how I investigated Indigenous gambling in regional Victoria, in, in a, a Koori community, and when I say, um, use the word Koori, it's a generic term for Aboriginal people, uh, mostly in uh, states like Victoria and New South Wales. Um, but I'd like to take a few minutes to walk you through what I think is an equally important part of the overall research proposal. 
Therefore, I'd like to begin this conversation by highlighting key concepts illustrated by Australian Indigenous scholars, such as the great Palawa warrior. Um, some of you put up your hand saying that you, were from, uh, that you had visited Tasmania. Um, the Palawa people are a tribe from Tasmania. So, Professor Japana Japananga Errol West, um, Dennis Foley, Karen Martin, uh, Norm Sheehan, and Brian Martin, whose collective research related to Indigenous knowledge resonates with other Indigenous academics throughout the world, such as Smith, Chalissa, Wilson, and Be Bezarab. In particular, these scholars remind us of the importance of following traditional law and protocol by positioning ourselves in relation to our research. Karen Martin described this step of the research process accordingly. Karen said, in providing these details, I am claiming and declaring my genealogy my ancestry and my position as researcher and author. I am also identifying, defying and describing the elements of Indigenous research. By positioning myself in relation to the study I'm undertaking, or the, the study I undertook, I should say, I'm in, I'm, I am illuminating the significance of Indigenous knowledge systems in the 21st century. And that's so important because a lot of researchers in Australia believe that if an Aboriginal person uh, lives, studies in an urban <coughs> environment, that they've lost their culture. And that's just nonsense. Um, I'm also looking at how our investigations can be so much richer and our discussions and analysis of data can be far more relevant and meaningful to those communities whom we are working with. So continuing a tradition of thousands upon thousands of years and following on from the work of my esteemed colleagues, I positioned myself. First, I'm a tribal Ngunnawal from the Tangany or Koorong region of South Australia, and this is where my immediate and extended family have lived since time began. We are saltwater people of the Southern Ocean, and my Ngunnawal or totem is a pelican, uh, or what we call the Nori. Uh, now, I do sincerely apologise for the quality of this slide. Uh, there's nothing I can do about it because it was a very old photo. Um, and I did want to just show you that this person actually did exist. And the person, the gentleman, is my biological great-great-great-grandfather. And we simply simplify things by just saying that, that we are the grandsons or granddaughters of Pulamim. Um, who many Ngunnawalis regard as the greatest warrior that our nation has ever known. And certainly I can tell you that I am here because of his strength, vision and courage against the full force of the British invasion of our country and subsequent colonisation. In terms of positioning myself and my research, I share with you that I'm from a tradition of ancient warriors philosophers of the highest order, inventors, artisans and artists. These include David Janipan, distinguished scientist who is featured on the Australian $50 bill. My sister cousin, Yvonne Kumatri, who is a master weaver and exhibits her work all over the world. And another sister cousin, Ruby Hunter, acclaimed national and international performer who, with her partner Archie Roach, highlighted through music and song issues that were specifically related to the stolen generations. So in Australia, it wasn't just one generation, but even today it continues. Um, many stolen generations, black deaths in custody, and the need for Indigenous Australians to have treaties. A brother, Jack Stingle, renowned artist. Then there's me, folks. I can't paint. 
I doubt if I'll ever invent anything useful. I certainly can't weave. I mean, my weaving is more like crochet. Uh, and I certainly can't sing like my sister cousin, Rubing. However, as one of the first Aboriginal teachers in Australia, my contribution to our nation and hopefully the rest of the country has been in the area of training Indigenous teachers, something that I've been passionate about for the last 30 years. And I also hope to make a difference through gambling education and research. Before I focus on my own investigation, I want to share a few thoughts with you regarding Indigenous research per se. And I'd like to begin by suggesting that we, as Indigenous researchers, undertake what I have labelled the inside-outside community research framework. A theory which, on, on paper and, and illustrated however way you wanted, columns, circles, whatever, um, it looks like a very simplistic worldview. However, uh, in each of those columns, there's at least 40 PhDs to be written. So the framework which I present suggests that we as Indigenous researchers are both inside our communities because we are part of those communities. On the other hand, we are part of a Western academy that makes us outside our representative communities. However, as we are enrolled as research students within the academy, we are inside of the academy. So in other words, for us as Indigenous people, we have a foot in both camps, and how good is that? And for us as Indigenous students, we are placed in very exciting worlds. I believe Foucault's analysis of power and knowledge would suggest the inside-outside research theory explains that we are privileged to access Indigenous knowledge and that we are able to represent that knowledge in ways that are respectful, empowering to our communities, and at the same time, increase the knowledge base of both the academy and broader society on issues that are pertinent to communities, our survival, our cultural maintenance, and general well-being. So in a nutshell, we are part of an incredibly exciting trend within, within the history of Australian universities and beyond. And I'm very honoured to be part of this international Indigenous education and research movement, and I'm sure you feel the same. In terms of my own research, um, it is significant for several reasons. Firstly, there's a great deal of unpublished anecdotal evidence within Aboriginal communities. And secondly, there's a paucity of research and published literature throughout Australian research communities that focuses specifically on Aboriginal and in, uh, on gambling and Indigenous people. And there's hardly work that has been undertaken in Australia that has investigated gambling through an Indigenous lens and solely by an Indigenous researcher. Further significance uh, of my research is encapsulated in some st statistical information. And I'll just illuminate a couple of things for you. Um, Australia's gambling ex expenditure in 2013 was approximately $18.1 billion that was spent on gambling, with $10.9 billion, or 60%, you know, give or take a few million. I mean, what's, what's a million here or there? Um, so that was the, the Australian expenditure. Um, now, in relation to that expenditure, um, in 2010, 17% of suicidal patients admitted to Melbourne's Alfred Hospital's emergency department were problem gamblers. Now, a major issue that we have with the information I shared on the last two slides is that we have no idea of the amount of money Aboriginal people are contributing to the overall gambling expenditure in Australia. We, uh, the research that has been done in a couple of communities, in a couple of states, we can sort of have a, a bit of a, um, a go at 
at estimating, but we still don't know precisely just how much money Aboriginal people throughout Australia are contributing to that overall expenditure. Nor do we have any idea of how many Aboriginal people present as suicidal because of their gambling at hospital emergency rooms. Having set the scene, I'll now proceed to discuss my research topic, uh, the social impact of Koori gambling in a regional Victorian community. Uh, my research um, sits very well with ethical guidelines. Um, however, I suspect very strongly that I'll bring to the research community knowledge that has not been investigated or presented before, and like I said, solely by an Indigenous person. For example, by studying gambling through an Indigenous lens, participants have shared with me the impact of previous government practices and policies that have resulted in generations of unresolved grief and trauma. Also bringing new knowledge to the gambling research community, I hope to raise awareness of Indigenous issues and through my findings, explore culturally appropriate harm minimisation strategies. These ideas have not come from me, but they have come from the participants. And one of the biggest myths in Australia is that um, the only grief and trauma experience was by those Aboriginal people who were stolen right? People like my sister cousin, Ruby Hunter. Believe you me, for those of us who were left behind, still felt that grief and trauma as well. So really, you can say it affected every Aboriginal person in the country. So to tap into this information, my research centre, um, research questions centred around why do we gamble, what are the gambling behaviours of our people uh, who gamble excessively and what are the social impacts. Uh, I had a few subsidiary questions, what are the gambling patterns uh, and that was interesting points that came out in my research, uh, the great concern that um, adults had for adolescent Aboriginal gambling in our community. They saw that as on the increase and um, made suggestions about what could be done to overcome that. Uh, I'll also mention to you that um, I wanted to get, uh, collect data from people um, who gambled excessively and I also wanted to get data from elders. Now, Sadly, um, the majority of those elders uh, from my sample, well, it turned out they were also excessive gamblers. Um, I'm not sort of really going to go through any um, literature review because it's a bit like, you know, preaching to the converted um, except to say um, the Canadian researcher, David Korn, as some of you probably have heard of, um, suggested that when we do uh, research, we should also look for any positive uh, on, on gambling. Uh, we should also look for some positive aspects, but uh, by far the negative um, uh, impacts outweighed any positive experience. Um, there's some features of the literature search and the data which emerged from my research. And it is a concept that um, I am labelling same but different. In other words, I'm suggesting from what I know and from what I've read and what participants said to me was that the reasons we gamble bear similarities to other gamblers in Australian society, but... There are major differences, just like these two cars, you know, the same, same model, different colour. Um, uh, there are major differences, and within the context of my research, I've explored in greater detail what these differences might be. And for us in Australia, for Indigenous people in Australia, it would appear that some of those differences um, could be the result of, of policies and practices that have governed and still influence the lives of Aboriginal people in contemporary society. 
um, the policies resulting in um, ongoing racism, black deaths in custody, and forced removal of Aboriginal children. And I just want to make a, a mention of, of racism uh, and tie it up with um, early e exposure. You know all the apps that, that anybody, kids can get, you know, on their phones? My 12-year-old grandson, and this only happened uh, less than three weeks ago, maybe two, two, two and a bit weeks ago. My poor little boy was shocked and horrified and disgusted. He showed me an app uh, available to anybody, um, and it was a game where you shoot the Aborigine. And the more points you get, I mean, this is Australia, you know, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, yeah, the more Aboriginal people you, you shoot, uh, the higher credits you get. Lucky country, eh, for some. Okay. Okay. Um, I talked about the intergenerational trauma, uh, unfulfilled um, uh, cultural obligations uh, resulting from, from gambling, um, and they basically were the differences between um, the reasons Aboriginal people gamble compared to um, non-Aboriginal people. Um, just very quickly then, um, in my research, I, I um, used an Indigenous lens, like I said. I uh, did a data analysis that used decolonisation theories, uh, and I also, as part of my methodology, I used the concept of, of yarning, which is a, a traditional Indigenous way of talking. But it's not, just, uh, it's not just sort of talking or asking questions the way we would if we were doing, uh, say, semi-structured interviews. Both the, the researcher and the participant journey together to collect data and discuss information which is of relevance to the topic. So it's, um, yarning is a very different um, way of gathering data to that of a semi-structured interview. And look, I, I might leave it there then. Um, so thank you very much. Yeah. When you were saying about it's quite difficult to quantify um, with Indigenous um, gamblers how much money they're spending, um, another aspect perhaps to that that I was thinking of is sometimes it's not how much goes through but that percentage of their overall income and when that percentage goes, you know, sort of, past 10%, past 20 yeah. past 30 past 40 Yes. And the other side mm. of it, I was wondering, are there not um, data collectors in Australia like our Department of Internal Affairs, you know, the regulators that are supposed to regulate the industry, are they not collecting that data? Um, no, basically. No. And they don't, there's no legislation that they have? No, have no, no. And so that's why, and I, I, I you know, as soon as I, I come across um, uh, an Aboriginal person who says, oh, I'm sort of interested in, in doing some research, come, come with me and do gambling, you know, let's, let's do gambling. Um, because there's just um, uh, so very few, um, um, in fact, I believe I'm the only Aboriginal person in the country, uh, one, one black fellow in all of Australia enrolled at a, um, a university who is researching gambling. So, yeah, so I jump on any of our people and say, you know, come and do gambling with me. Um, so, uh, on the back of the first question, um, so the, the role of the regulator in New Zealand is really interesting because they do provide the rules and regulations around by which gambling is permitted in New Zealand. So, in New Zealand, um, a certain portion of it has to go back to the communities, but um, Māori have been raising the, um, the argument that the money comes out of South Auckland and it ends up in the yacht clubs of Rimuera and the oh. tennis courts of yeah. other places. Yes. I just think, um, backing on the first person, 
Um, maybe one of your future research projects could get you a baseline where you can actually map what communities <coughs> are spending so that you have those numbers because those things are the things that tell the story, eh? You yes. Yes, and certainly in, in my, my PhD, that's exactly uh, one of the areas that I want to cover so that we can, um, yeah, we can, you know, go to um, health authorities and government officials and say, you know, look, there's the evidence um, from, um, you know, our communities. Um, so, you know, you better support us, basically. And so you need a statistician for that because... Non-Indigenous people are very precious about numbers and power yeah. calculations and thresholds for your data being relevant. And if you ever need those, in, in, in New Zealand we have um, growing Māori and Pacific research units and there are, there are a number of Māori and Pacific Island statisticians who can help you with that. Fantastic. Yeah, and I'll certainly be tapping into that and thank you very, very much indeed for that.